Welcome everyone to this April edition of the Uni Community Hours. We have a pretty packed schedule today, so let's get right into it. I'm going to briefly present the news for Uni 2022-04, and very briefly because almost all the new things will be later presented by other people. So let's get to it. First of all, now SALT SSH will be using the SALT bundle. This is something that maybe you remember. It was initially included in 2022-03, but we had to remove because we had some problems. Now it's included and it's fully working. If you want to review the details about this, you can go to the early uni community hours recordings that are available at the wiki page, but uh, very briefly remember that the SALT bundle is a way we have to distribute SALT with all the dependencies included into a single package, so we can deploy SALT everywhere, even if the required Python is not available. So that serves us to deploy to all the operating systems. Very briefly, did mean, this means that now you can use the web UI to onboard, for example, CentOS 7 clients, and that will, that will use the SALT bundle. Then we have a technology preview, which is the containerized UNI proxy and retail branch server. Um, if I recall correctly, we already had some presentations, exactly. A presentation at the previous community hours, but now Cedric will present what is new here and what are the upcoming things. Then we also have reporting database improvements. This reporting database was also presented during the previous community hours, but today Michael and Thomas are going to, to talk about the, the recent uh, improvements. Then Vladimir is going to present the improved image management. And Johannes will present HSTS, um, which basically is going to force HTTPS in all the connections. But uh, as Johannes will explain later, this is for now something optional that you will need to enable and it's not mandatory. And with that, we have a few minutes for some questions about this, but I would really recommend that you, went, that you wait until the other presenters can present their stuff. Um, of course, they can, you can ask for a lot of details there and they will be able to tell you more better than anything I can tell. So my only question is when 2204? <laughs> Yeah, we were having some problems now. Uh, just before this meeting, I got the approval from Quality Engineering to release it. So I will start doing it right after the community hours, provided that we don't have any problems building any packages at OBS. And hopefully it should be announced later today. That's great, thanks. Okay, any other questions? Remember anyway that at the end of this session, we will have even more time for questions and answers and your ideas and everything else. So don't, don't worry, there will be plenty of time. Okay, then Vladimir, Vladimir, you are first. Okay, let me start sharing my screen. Can you see my browser? Yes. Okay, uh, so um, we have improved image management. Uh, at the beginning, I just go quickly through things that didn't change uh, for building OS images and container images. You first need some build host. That means enable these properties, container build host and OS image build host. Uh, then you need uh, configure store for 
uh, Docker images uh, create profiles for both uh, Kiwi or Docker images. Uh, good source for uh, profiles is uh, this uh, GitHub repo. Uh, I have uh, uh, I here are here are examples plus documentation how to use them and uh, this my profile is exactly from this repo and now I can get to things that are new. Uh, Basically, the improvement is that this table was changed to better correspond to reality. Uh, for OS images, it, it means that we can build multiple revisions of uh, one source and these uh, builds are uploaded uh, to a directory on, on Unis server. Um, as, and all these images can exist on the server in parallel and that means that this table shows each built image, each revision. Uh, be because before there was only one entry and it was named after profile, not with the real name, so it was really confusing. So as I just said, for Kiwi Im images, the real name of the image is taken from Kiwi sources uh, and the building works uh, that when you Start building Kiwi profile. You have select the profile, select build host. I, I won't demonstrate it here because it takes 20 minutes and we don't have that much time. Uh, but basically, when you start building OS image, uh, you get uh, this entry in this image table with tempor temporary placeholder name. Uh, which consists of name of the profile. Then if building fails, it stays like this. Um, but if building succeeds, then you get a real name of, <coughs> of the image that was built and in <coughs> including version. Uh, and a revision is automatically increased in case there are multiple images with the same name and version. Um, next change is that if you go to image details, you can see all the files that, that were built and were uploaded uh, to, um, to this web directory. You can download it uh, directly from here. Uh, next improvement is that uh, on this step you can see build log from Kiwi. So in case building fails for any reason, you can hopefully see here what happened. Uh, this image built successfully. So you can see the success and result files. Mm. I have a question. Would it be yeah. too difficult adding a link to download the log? Mm. It's now it's not implemented, but it's quite easy to add. Uh, 
I can do it for next release. Mm, that would be nice because then I think a user can download the log and then grab to look for things. Sometimes it's easier that you, than using Control F. So that, mm. that could be useful. Okay. Uh, um, Vladimir? Yeah. In the list of files that are uploaded to the server, um, the, the, the first two entries were truncated. Is it because your screen is too small or? Uh, it's because uh, uh, I increase font size. Mm, should be okay. visi visible here. Okay. So maybe it would be interesting to have the uh, auto wrapping of these fields maybe. Mm, actually, I don't understand why it's not by default. Okay. Uh, yeah. So to continue, uh, a another change is that all these files uh, are a, a reference in the database and are connected with this entry in this table. So if you click on delete, it uh, deletes uh, image files and also, I didn't mention that for Pixie images, there is also a uh, image pillars. Uh, if we go through here on the minion, here you can see that we have uh, images pillar which references uh, this graphical image with two releases. Uh, and all this is referenced in the database. And if you delete this entry, all this is deleted too. Uh, so you don't have to do any manual cleanup. Uh, I think that's all for o OS or KV images. Uh, there, are, uh, there is one change for container images. Uh, before the entry or um, container images are uh, in the end uploaded to Docker store and in the store, they are referenced by name and version. So if you build a new revision, it's over, it's rewritten in the store. Um, uh, there was a problem with this implementation because uh, this entry in the table was recycled and used for building new revision immediately when you started uh, building. Uh, now the difference is that when we start building new revision, uh, it creates new entry and now we can wait a few seconds. Not yet. Mimba, I have a question while yeah. you, you wait for it to build. Uh, the columns, patches, and packages, I guess those mean the things that are pending installation. Yeah, yeah. yeah. these are number of uh, packages that uh, where updates are available. Yeah, because initially when I saw the table, I got confused a, a little bit when I saw that uh, they are all zero. <laughs> but yeah, uh, of course, this is pending. The database it. contains also complete number of packages, but it's not shown in, in this table. I'm not sure if it would make sense to edit. No, but what I was thinking is that maybe it makes sense to somehow maybe of I don't know maybe it's just me but indicate somehow that the column packages refers to pending package updates because otherwise mm -hmm. it was not really clear for me from the start okay 
So uh, now it's built and you can see we got a uh, new revision six and um, it was uh, replaced in the store and all the previous versions were marked as obsolete, but they are still referenced in the database. You can show them with this checkbox and we still have uh, uh, all the details uh, and we still have, uh, for example, list of packages used in this obsolete uh, revisions. Um, and uh, last thing that was improved that uh, the XML RPC API was updated uh, to uh, so now it should be possible to manipulate uh, with this image and change whatever is needed. Um, and I think that's all from my side. So any more questions? If you've ever built a lot of OS images, this is really, really helpful. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, having all the history is really, really useful and having the logs, see how things were built, the packages you had in previous version, it's very nice. OK, if we don't have more questions, then the next presenter is Cedric with the technology preview for containerized Uniproxy and Red Airborne Server. Okay, let me share my screen. Um, it should be this one. So hopefully will you see my browser? Yes. Okay. So um, last time I presented how we can create a proxy, um, a containerized proxy using the uh, space command um, to get the configuration. The big improvement here is that we also have a UI now to create the, the configuration. So this is the proxy configuration tab here. Uh, you have um, quite a big form. Basically, uh, you have mandatory data at the top and then all the SSL certificate handling at the bottom. So for SSL certificates, you have two options. Either you generate one, but you need to have the CA private key and, and its password, or you provide existing um, certificates in case you, you have requested it from a third party. So here, let's try. So the, Um, the parent FQDN is either the FQDN of the server or the one of an of a parent proxy. In, in this case, I will use the uh, the server. I don't have that many proxies at hand. Uh, the max quiz cache size. Well, let's say something small. And um, there comes the fun. So I will create a certificate. And uh, to create the certificate here, you will ask me why all, aren't we delegating that to um, Susan Manager? Well, to Uni, sorry. Um, this is because the Uni process is running, well, it, it's the Tomcat, in fact, and it's running as Tomcat user. And Tomcat user doesn't have access to SSL build folder that you have on, on your server, because this one is only for root. So what I, I made here, what you have to, to do is copy this SSL build, or at least the uh, CA certificate and private key onto your machine, and then select them here. So the CA certificate here, this is the one um, you want to pick. So 
origin or trusted SSL cert. And a private key is this one. So if you have your own um, certificate uh, CAs and and not these uh, the ones from uh, from Uyuni, you can use them here. Just uh, be aware by copying these files to your machine that you need to keep them secure. These are sensitive data. So uh, enter the CA private key password. Um, all the certificate data are optional just because otherwise it will pick up defaults and the defaults are the same then for uni like uh, country code is de state is bayern city is nuremberg you don't wonder why and now i click it the generate button and it will provide me with a file download of a, of a zip file I will save this file and I need to keep it safe as well because it contains some sensitive data. Um, and I will upload that folder, that, that table to the um, proxy host. And I will just uh, unzip it into etc uni proxy. So you see here um, all the files. So you, uh, you have the server key. So this is uh, kind of sensitive. You have the uh, server SSH push private key. So better keep them safe. Um, here it's readable by everyone. So um, better spot um, 600 everything. And you'll be good. Now I can just run the the proxy the um, system the proxy pod. Uh, so start a uni proxy pod. And then we have our pod that is started with all the uh, containers. Um, so just as a heads up this is the what it will be released and uh, what is now what will stay here for a while we are currently working on on getting these containers to kubernetes and it will require some configuration changes it's not that bad because um the uh, configuration, you can regenerate the configuration with the UI. It, it will not change anything in the, um, in the, in, on the server side, but it will create you a new table that you will upload to, to the server, to the proxy. Um, so basically I can click on that button again and it will just generate me another one. In the system list here, uh, so just to show how it looks like, so you have the dev proxy host. Um, this is the uh, the registered system I used. And uh, this one requires uh, the, uh, for a slash, uh, typically you need the containers module for Padman. And you also need the client tools to get the systemd package. And uh, that's about it. On the system list, you have the, the proxy here. It's indicated as a foreign uh, system type. So when you click on it, you have almost nothing. Um, that was probably here before, but you have the SSH port here that is indicated is not 22, just to not conflict with the one on the host. And uh, yes, that's it. So for the retail part, uh, I will not present it here because I am not really familiar with it. But Andre has a talk about uh, about it. It's called Salt Boot Deployment, and it will be at OpenSUSE conference uh, uh, early June. 
So be sure to, to be there if you're interested. And maybe you have questions. I have one. You mentioned that for Kubernetes, we will need to regenerate the tables, right? Yes. Will those new tables still be compatible with proxies that, that are based on Podman and not Kubernetes? That's the ID, yes. Mm -hmm. But uh, in order to be, uh, for these configurations to be usable by both the Podman, Podman, case, Podman case and the Kubernetes case, we need to change the configuration files a little bit. And while we are at it, the zip file will be also changed to targz. So there, is, there will be no need to, to schmod anymore. Ah, OK. <laughs> Another question. So the host system where this is now running, you said it's a SLES and a container image. So, but I think uh, you can also use an OpenSUSE the leap and with the oh, sure. unique client tools channel. Yep. <laughs> it's just that uh, I recreated the system a few hours ago and just used the uh, SUMA form config I had at hand. Okay, any other questions? Just remember for now, this is a technology preview, but this is still in usable, usable, usable state on top of Podman. So give it a try. Please send us all the feedback you think it's relevant because it will be useful for you need to improve what we are doing. Yeah, whenever we have tech preview, for uyuni that means please try please try it <laughs> i know i'm going to be trying it soon yeah cool. and even if it is technical preview yeah of, for sure it means it's not production ready itself but that's, that doesn't mean we are not going to provide any kind of reply if you provide the feedback with GitHub cards or mailing lists, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, please try it and let us know. I would even say as the country, <laughs> because if it's tech preview, it means that we are actively working on it. So it's easier to, to answer. Okay, so if we don't have any other questions, the next presenter is Johannes and the availability of HSDS. Yeah, hi, I hope you can hear and see me well. Let me quickly share my screen. Okay, uh, switch to the browser. Can you see my browser? Yes. Very nice. So. Uh, HSTS. So this is so I'm going to explain you about strict transport security. This is a mechanism to basically improve security for your web app, um, and it's uh, and from the technology side is based on a response header. That means a web application can send a header with with all of each uh, with all of the responses to tell the browser that this application should be accessed only via HTTPS and never using plain HTTP. For instance, if if you would inside this application, if you would click a link there that has an HTTP link to that same application, the browser would make sure to use HTTPS instead. So um, we implemented this for Uyuni because some users were asking for this specifically. And because it's just a response header, it is easily implemented by um, setting this in the Apache configuration. So we we came up with a patch, a simple patch. I'm, I'm, this might be a little bit too small. Uh, we came up with a simple patch to uh, change the Apache configuration to just always set this header. Uh, it has a max age parameter. That means the browser, when it receives this header for the first time, then for 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 this time it will store this configuration so uh, 
I don't know how, how long is this, but um, for all the time that you set here, uh, I think it could be two years per default. Um, uh, it for, for all this time, it would make sure that it would cache this web application and would make sure to use HTTPS for all the connections. And the same we are doing for the, um, uh, sorry, for the proxy as well. So it's only a setting for the Apache of the proxy and the server. So after we implemented that, we went for testing it and we found out that actually another, um, not, not a side effect, but another effect of this uh, mechanism is that browsers would no longer allow you to make exceptions in case your um, certificate is a, is a self-signed one or, or the, the CA that signed the uh, SSL certificate is not trusted by your browser. The thing is, we, we could never produce this, but we have one person in, in our group that, that was able to reproduce this, uh, that's Dawn. Um, and in, so basically, if you enable this, then your browser should not allow you to, to make an exception to accept the self-signed certificate. And the default certificate of Uyuni is, is uh, signed by the, yeah, the, the CA. <laughs> The, uh, it's basically self-signed, so uh, you would no longer be able to uh, access Uyuni in this case. And uh, until you are... import the CA, exactly. So um, that's also written here in the uh, in the official RFC about HSTS that the solution for this is to import the CA, your own CA. Uh, certificate into the browser of all your users. So, but because of that, uh, we decided that this might be too disruptive to make it a default for everyone. So in the end, we actually decided for now uh, to disable this header by default. So we came up with another small patch that basically uh, comments it out in the Apache configurations of proxy as well as the server. But if you wanted to enable it as a user, you can now easily go there and just uncomment it, restart Apache um, on bro proxy and server, and then you have enabled it. So the only thing you need to make sure or you need to be um, uh, careful is that users might no longer be able to access it un un unless you import the CA certificate that is used to sign the SSL certificate uh, into the browser of all the users. And in case you are using the default certificates, you can get it from the pub directory of the server. And how to do that, we have described it here in a paragraph for the documentation. Uh, looks more or less like this. Yeah, uh, but Johannes, uh, if I may, uh, sure. it didn't, uh... He didn't make it in time for the documentation for 2004. So for now, the instructions about how to do this, how to do this, what Johannes is now showing on screen, is only on the release notes. But remember that you should always read the release notes when we have a new version. It will right. be part of 2022-05 documentation. Yeah. Yeah, we just merged this today to the docs and it's too late for, for uni. But um, in the release notes, you will see that um, you can find the certificate that you need to import to the browser in the pub directory of the server. And from there, it's quite easy. You can just go to the browser settings. There's a certificate section, and usually there's an import function, so you can import your own certificates there. Um, yeah, and that's basically it. Yeah, we should also mention, of course, <laughs> even if, if uh... It's implicit by by what Johannes told that another alternative, if, if you don't want to import a CA certificate to the browsers, is that then you need to use a certificate signed by the trusted CA on the server, and well, in the end, on the proxies as well, if you intend to connect using HTTPS to the proxies somehow. But please, one thing that is important, if you are thinking about using let's let's encrypt do not expose your uni server directly to the internet use another mechanism to get the uh, certificate okay 
if if there is no further questions, I think that's it. Very well, then we have a last presentation from Michael and Thomas about the reporting database improvements. Yep. So, I think you see my browser now. So, um, yeah. Um, the reporting improvements um, are now really um, uh, tied to the hub. Um, setup. Um, hub setup means that you have a central uh, uni server and you have a peripheral uni servers uh, which are managed by the hub. So you register peripheral uh, uni servers to the hub uni server. And um, <clears throat> with such a setup, uh, you can spread the load of a lot of clients. Um, on multiple servers, but have still the central management. Um, now, when it comes to reporting, you want also the reports uh, back synced to the hub, so that you have one central place where you have all the reports from all your clients, which are assigned to all the peripheral servers you are managing with your hub. And uh, this second step is now the one uh, what we concentrated in the last weeks on uh, and uh, the outcome is something i wanted to show you now so here uh, is a hub server and uh, as you can see we have here two peripheral servers registered so what we have now here is a special icon um, and uh, for these kind of systems and when you go into the details you have here a new tab. So similar to the proxy tab, when you have, have a uni proxy, you have now here a peripheral server tab when you are on a uni server. So this gives you a small UI about uh, some details. So first, uh, yeah, the, the name uh, and the version uh, of this peripheral server. And now some details about the reporting database, which are available on that server. So uh, we have here the report database name, then we have the connection parameters, the um, host name and the port number, uh, the user. So we create uh, a read only user um, for every, uh, um, the hub itself create an own user just for this purpose. And that one is a read only user. Uh, and here we have uh, a timestamp about when this was last synced. Uh, and another thing what we have here is, as you can see, of course, we don't display the password here, but uh, the password is auto-generated. And uh, when you just press on this one here, uh, you would just generate a new password. So if there's a need for changing the password, just press that button. Um, this initiate a state apply uh, with an, a new written uh, state module, which reset the uh, password on the um, reporting database of the peripheral server uh, to a new random one. So uh, this about uh, the, the onboarding of a peripheral server uh, on the hub side. Uh, and now let's have a look at the uh, task matic tasks. So um, I think the last time when we presented, uh, you should already be aware of this one. Uh, this is the a task which exists on every uh, Uyuni server. Uh, and this is responsible for getting the data from this server uh, database into the reporting database of this server. So in case when I run this here uh, on the hub, this means I'm now collecting all the data from the hub and inserting these data into the hub reporting database. So this includes now all the registrations uh, we have here, in this case of the two peripheral servers, uh, the packages I have synced here, the channels and, and uh, a lot of other uh, things. So, and then we have a second job and this is a new job and this is uh, MGR update uh, reporting hub bunch. 
And this job is now responsible for connecting to all the registered peripheral servers, connecting to all their reporting databases and getting the data from these reporting databases and inserting these data uh, into the reporting database of the hub. So um, this job uh, can take long. Uh, this highly depends on how many peripheral servers you are managing here. So of course, in this case, uh, as we have only two, and these two do not have so many data, uh, this is pretty um, pretty uh, fast. So as you can see, I think it take, take a second here. Yeah. Okay. Um, we made a lot of uh, speed improvements um, uh, also in the last days. Um, and uh, I think the last time what I did was um, a pretty packed reporting database um, and we were able to mirroring uh, 20 peripheral servers in six minutes. Um, and uh, so this is uh, something uh, which is already working pretty fast. So to show you a bit, little bit about the outcome. Uh, so here you can uh, connect to the reporting database uh, also with the spacewalk SQL command dash I. And when you give dash dash report DB, you are automatically connecting directly to the report DB. So here you can see um, what we have. Um, you have, we have tables and views. Uh, and uh, so the tables are um, containing the, the data. The views are meant already for um, ready to use reports. Um, more on that later. Um, I just wanted to show you this one example. So this is now uh, into the inventory report. Uh, and here, the first two lines, you can see they have the management ID one. Management ID one means that this is the, let's say something like localhost. So this is from data from the server where this reporting database belongs to. And in this case, this means we are on the hub. So this is the reporting database of the hub. And that means these systems are connected to the hub directly. And they have these system IDs. And now when we are mirroring uh, the data from the uh, peripheral servers, we are changing the management ID of that server with the real management ID this server has here on the hub. So that means here peripheral server two has the system ID uh, 10001000. And this is what you see also here. And that means this system, the CentOS client, exists on the peripheral server two while peripheral server one, the one which ends here with a one, is this row here. And um, uh, on this server, we have connected a slash client. So this is a mechanism uh, we have here. And uh, with this, you can get all the data uh, from all your peripheral servers uh, to uh, your hub reporting database. One uh, thing which um, is obvious when you see this structure is, of course, we only support one level. So you can have one hub which has peripheral servers, but you cannot have peripheral servers of peripheral servers. That would not really fit here. <coughs> okay. Um, oops. So. Um, yeah, that's about uh, the mechanisms. Uh, and um, for some more information about the reporting schema and what has changed there, um, I will hand over to Thomas. And um, as you see this here, we have here a link for the schema for its schema documentation. But uh, this one did not make it to 2022.04. Um, you will find it in the next version. Okay, Thomas, are you ready? Yes, so let me quickly share my screen. Okay, can you see my screen? Not yet, now. 
Okay, so uh, talking about the changes in the schema, last time we talked about this topic, we said that uh, we were most having a preview and a technology preview and idea of what we wanted to implement. Now, we did, this was the schema that we had in previous version of Uni, and it was mostly centered around uh, the system and everything was connected to that. Um, now we have added, as you can see from the new schema, lots of information and lots of tables. So let me quickly go through what is changed, uh, what are the major changes. So basically we still have uh, the information related to the system, but we worked to connect uh, the information related to the channels, to the packages, to the errata, to connect them together and uh, give you the possibility to create a uh, more, more performant, performing query to connect all the data and all the pieces. So you can see that we have now the channel which is connected to the packages. So you can know where from which channels the packages are coming. We have the information about the repository and the same for errata and patches. Then we added the information around uh, the accounting. So the user connected to the system, the group of user and how that connects to the system and the system groups and the permission uh, of the user to access the system. So now you can have an overview on, uh, on that part uh, of the system as well, both for the local server and uh, both for in a hub scenario. And also the last piece of information that we added is related to the SCAP scans. So you can have an overview on all the security scan you have performed uh, on each system and what are the results uh, of all of them. So uh, in this way, we hope that uh, we give the user the possibility to build a better report. And we have also added uh, many pre-configured -pre uh, reports ready to be used in, as views, as Michael was already, already suggesting. But um, in practice, how do you, how do you use this? So, the first step that you have to do is to create a user. So for doing that, you can use the UniSetup RepertDB user. With this tool, you create a new user. So for example, let's quickly create a user. So now with this user, you can connect them um, from every machine, because as we said previously in our previous uh, demos, these. Uh, this database, the reporting database is exposed externally. And so, for example, the, the easiest way that you can connect is using directly psql, so through Postgres directly. And as you can see now, I am connecting to the reporting database. And as we said, uh, we have all the tables that uh, I showed you before. But as I said, we have also many views. These are mostly all the views that we have added. They are almost all, they are new now. And we have added lots of information related to the accounting, to the action report, to system history and system based on the type of the event. <clears throat> and also uh, reports regarding the packages and the system that the, the packages that are installed on the system. So we can just uh, query one of the, uh, the view, for example, the for example the system package up, uh, installed report. Sorry, package installed report. So here you can have an overview on all the system and the package and the version that are installed on each system. And you can also filter this data. So for example, if you are interested only on one specific system, you can specify the system ID here in the query. You will have the information about that one. And through Postgres, you can directly export, for example, this query as a CSV file, for example, uh, like this. System. And this will generate a CSV uh, that can be opened and consumed with every with every tool that we want. But um, 
This is the easiest and the most low level way that you can access, but the most interesting way is to connect a database tool. So for, as an example, I can use LibreOffice uh, base to connect to the database. So I can, I can just point my tool uh, to, the, to the database. So the host uh, is uh, unique. And the database name is uh, ReportDB. So you can specify the user that you have created previously as the connection. And then you can save the database. And here you can see that you can access uh, all the tables that they showed previously. And you have also the report. So you can, for example, open. Um, uh, one table and uh, have a look at the data there directly in your tool. And with a tool like this, you can also generate uh, queries that you want to build, or you can build directly a report using wizards. So, for example, here from the uh, LibreOffice tool, you can have a look at the selected table, for example, the history, choose uh, your uh, column that you want to export and generate every kind of report that you want. This is the most uh, powerful way to use this tool is, uh, as I said, connect uh, your, your tool. And you're not limited, of course, to LibreOffice. You can use whatever, whatever tool that supports uh, a direct SQL connection, basically. And apart from that, I can also give you a um, quick uh, sneak peek at what's coming next, uh, because um, as Michael said, one of the things that we have been working is the is the documentation. And as he already said, it's not part, unfortunately, of this release, but it's part of the next one. But I can show you quickly how the documentation works. And um, yeah, this is based on a tool that generates the documentation from the schema. And here you can navigate the through the structure of the database. Basically, we have the list of the tables that we have and the list of the views that we have. And for each one, you can see, for example, if you choose the channel package table, you can see the list of the fields that we have. And you can see the relationship between that table and the other one. So you can see that it's connected with the channel and the package. And this view is uh, totally browsable. So I can click on channel and go to this specific table to see what are the information that are, that are available there. And yeah, the same for here, you can see from the diagram what are the uh, tables that are connected to this one. And you have, can have a big picture of uh, everything uh, that's in the database. And you can also have a look on uh, all the views that we have and everything. But as I said, this unfortunately is not part of this release. It will be part of the next one. And uh, as part of the next one, we will have also an update on the Spacewalk uh, report tool, because now we have the Spacewalk report tool to generate reports. This tool has been updated to use the, um, the new reporting database. So for example, if I run uh, like this, the report for the inactive system, I can have the list of the inactive system. And this, as you can see, has been updated. You can see it from the new fields that we have, the new columns that we have here in the report. We have the management ID and the sync date. So the date when the, this data was last synced from the database. And if you run this tool on the server, the main server in the hub, you will be able to see the information of all the peripheral server. And this is very helpful to use uh, if you are already using this tool uh, for for your report you can keep using it but there's a catch in that because as we added uh, the new information and the, the, since the data is, is coming from a new database the structure and the format of the data may differ because I, uh, for example here you can see we had the two, two columns already so if you are processing this with some automated tool this may break and uh, to compensate for that, we added a new parameter here that will allow you to use the legacy report system. So if you specify this command line, 
it will execute the query in the old way, and so it will be totally backward compatible to what to what we had before uh, before this update. But as I said, this part is not is not part of this release as well. It will be part of the next one. And yeah, that's basically all for me. So if you have any questions about uh, the scheme and the reporting database, yeah, we will be happy to answer. I like this. Thank you. Uh, one question on the sync part. Um, is it doing an incremental sync or is it doing a full sync of the database each time you that job runs? It's a full sync complete. So because um, currently it, it was uh, much easier to say about, OK, we delete all and reinsert everything again. Otherwise, we somehow need to find out, OK, what is already in? And if it's in, what is there something which needs to be updated? Because yeah. it might uh, be outdated. So some, some columns might have changed. And in the end, if I have to do that one, uh, we either need to work with some kind of checksums of a, of a row, so, uh, of a line, uh, and say, OK, um, only if the checksums are the same, uh, we do not need to sync. Or we need to sync anyway, everything <laughs> over the line. So um, we see if it's, so as I said, so um, we can be pretty fast with that one. Um, of course, it depends a little bit also on the bandwidth you have. Yeah, so um, I was going to say bandwidth and size, but between the SUSE manager servers and the hub, it seems like it should be good. Yeah, I right. hope so. In practice, um, in most practice, it would be good. If it becomes a problem, then maybe we need to work on that one again and think about different solutions. But no, oh, this takes our reporting to a whole nother better level. Thank you guys for working on this. By the way, um, so yeah, as um, so about this new um, Spacewalk report tool and especially about the last Zunk. Um, by default, we are Zunking the data or creating new data one time per day um, for normally reporting that should be enough, I think. Um, but if really um, it's required to have a more current data, whatever, then of course, um, all this is task-o-matic task, and the uh, time of the schedules can be adapted. Uh, so you just need to go to the uh, UI, and then you can, uh, yeah, uh, zunk more often. Uh, but of course, that creates more load on the server. So it's up to you what, um, how often you might think you want to uh, to zunk that one. And of course, the manual contains also some tuning uh, informations um, because you can um, change the, the uh, number of worker threads for uh, mirroring the, the reporting databases to the hub. The default is two. Um, and uh, but yeah, you if um, your network connection and your um, uh, server support that so you can increase that. So I these um, resuming 20 servers in six minutes, uh, I used eight workers. Uh, and also the batch size can be adapted, which means that the um, uh, the number of rows uh, fetched with one uh, call uh, can be changed. The default is, I think, 2,000. And um, uh, I, um, so it, I think you, you, uh, the tuning here affects more uh, slow, uh, has more effect on slow servers. Uh, if you have more slow servers, uh, then uh, it might uh, be better to have bigger uh, batch sizes here. Um, if you have fast connected servers, then uh, the batch size can be can be lower. <clears throat> so 
So um, I made a try with 8,000, uh, which uh, still improves the situation uh, when I was thinking from uh, the other side of the world. And uh, so, but it did not change anything in uh, when thinking uh, from inside of the same data center. Okay, we are slightly over time, but I guess we have a bit of time for more questions. Something quick if you want for this or something unrelated to the presentation. Well, then since someone is going to ask later anyway, I guess Somebody will be interested on when we are going to switch Uyuni to be based on LDIP 15.4. The expectation, but it's not a promise, is that we will be doing it probably in June. We will start developing the changes before, after we release 2020.05. That should be the last release based on LDIP 15.3. After that, we will start making the things stable on top of LIP 15.4. And then after LIP 15.4 is published as a stable general availability of first customer shipment, we should have the next unit release changing the base operating system. And if we don't have any other questions, then thanks a lot to all the presenters for presenting. Thanks to all of you for attending your questions. Please remember to provide us with as much feedback as you can about the things we presented today. Remember that you can reach us at the mailing lists with the uni bugs at GitHub and also at Gitter. Enjoy Uyuni 2022-04 as soon as it's released, as I told before, hopefully before the end of the day. And we hope to see you soon next month for the next session of the Uyuni Community Hours. So enjoy the weekend. Bye-bye and see you very soon. Thank you, Julio. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Thank you. Ciao.